afterburner. We accept the fact that we had to sacrifice a whole Saturday in detention for whatever it was we did wrong. But we think you're crazy to make us write an essay telling you who we think we are. And you see us as you want to see us. In the simplest terms, with the most convenient definitions. But what we found out is that each one of us is a brain. And an athlete. And a basket case. A princess. And a criminal. Does that answer your question? Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It is Sound Opinions. Jim DeRogatis of the Chicago Sun-Times, Greg Cott of the Chicago Tribune. I'm Marty Leonards, and we have John Hughes, the director of Breakfast Club. John, I hope you don't mind that we took an excerpt from your film. <laughs> <laughs> I said that was the Billy Corrigan life story there, wasn't it? <laughs> It could have been. I think I so. I've that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm becoming a relic. <laughs> Takes us back, John. We grew up with that stuff. That's right. I was already grown up when I did it, so I, I am really a relic. Well, for <laughs> you it was sociology, but for us it was our life, you know? That's true. That's true. What about, uh, John, we're going to sort of talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, getting into, into film, but specifically how you were able to use music so well in your films, especially in that, in that particular scene that we just uh, sort of gave a little excerpt from, it seemed like you were always thinking in terms of how you were able to work music and musical elements into your movies. They, they were an integ integral part of your scripts, it seemed like, as opposed to just sort of being sort of glommed on at the end to sell a movie or something like that. The, the, the whole relationship between images and music seemed to be totally your thing. I mean, that, where, where did that come from? How did, how did you sort of develop that? Well, I would rather have been a musician than anything else, you know, and hmm. when, I, you know, when I was in high school, I uh, wasn't the most popular person, <laughs> um, and I found solace in music, you know, and in, in having my own taste and my own style, and I loved finding a band that nobody else had heard of yet. And when I got a chance to make pictures, you know, I was, you know, I was determined to get the music right. Well, what did you play, John? Did you grow up playing an instrument? <laughs> okay. Uh, guess. <laughs> if, you're, if you're no good and you're in a band, what do you play? Uh, drums? <laughs> no, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta be pretty good to play drums. <laughs> Rhythm guitar. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, you can't turn up past three, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Three chords. And if you're really bad, they'll turn you all the way down. But, you, you know, you get to go and stand up there and mm -hmm. be in the lights. <laughs> hey, Jack, could you, did you gig Excuse around me town? for a second, Jack. Could you pull your microphone down just a sure. little bit? We have to really be up on top of that thing. Okay. You were in a, a band that gigged around, uh, around town when you were growing up? <laughs> <laughs> around a suburban town. Well, you know what I mean. Garage yeah, band. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know, it was the, uh, the, um, uh, Shadows of Night days. You know? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Vox organ? No, we didn't have an organ. Okay. We had two bass players. <laughs> two bass players? <laughs> one, <laughs> one played bass and the other drove. So, or Nick Coleman before <laughs> it's kind time. of like avant garde. <laughs> avant garde rock. Yeah. yeah, it was Tortoise. Two basses. There you go. Yeah, there you the, go. the other bass wasn't, he wasn't plugged in. He didn't want to be. He just <laughs> wanted to be up on the stage. And he drove, which, you know, was, it, was, it was a lot better to be driven by someone who's close to your own age than having your dad drive you to your gig. It's you essential. Know. Absolutely <laughs> essential. essential. The car is essential. You know, in the big Chevy station wagon, you know. <laughs> and then they stay and watch the show and wave and say, that's my son. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the guy that's not playing. That's right. So uh, the, the idea of using music in these, in these films that you were scripting and, and directing was sort of a natural extension of that. I mean, to me, what was intriguing about your movies was that early on, I mean, nobody knew who Simple Minds was before The Breakfast Club, except for the hardcore fans. Yeah. So you must have somehow <laughs> been yeah, among that hardcore elite that found out about Simple Minds before anybody knew or what, 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 what were your uh, criteria for, for choosing songs? How did you how did It was you what I was out? listening to. Hmm. Um, I discovered, when I was in high school, I discovered Melody Maker. And I could, I could take the train downtown, go to State and Randolph, there was a big uh, newsstand there that had out-of-town papers. And I'd pick up um, Melody Maker and New Musical Express from, from England. And I noticed that the charts were different. And there were all these, you know, number one song in England was not the same as the number one song in America. And I'd think, well, where can I get this band? So there were, there were little ads that would say, we export. So I would, you know, I, I got like say, pretty things. I had the you know the Who album very early. Mm -hmm. I had the Who album at the same time Rubber Soul came out because mm -hmm. uh, Rubber Soul came and I said goodbye. <laughs> 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 Too many acoustic guitars. I'm leaving. You know, <laughs> Checking out. Know, uh oh, was, Terry Hammer alert. I was, I was 15 and you know you don't want uh, Norwegian Wood wasn't any good at 15. You know it didn't, <laughs> didn't go quite hard enough. 
So I, you know, I'd always maintained that connection to the import record world, and I discovered there's a wonderful record store here in, in town called Wax Tracks. It was on uh, Lincoln Avenue. It was on Lincoln, yeah. right by the Biograph. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday I'd go down there and buy my, my load of records and go home and make a 90-minute cassette tape, <laughs> which in those days I could. You know, there was so much music you know, right. in the 70s, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. I, I just, you know... You go to that new release of singles bin, right? <laughs> you know, it was those, <laughs> some, right those British <laughs> singles. And some of yeah. those, you know, I used to buy ska records that were hand-stamped. Mm -hmm. yeah. They probably pressed 500 of them. Right. Know? And I, you know, I built a huge collection, and I, it was the only thing I ever took care of. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> I had a big record collection, and uh, uh, I had, you know, Simple Minds. I, I, right. I presumed everybody knew who Simple Minds was, because they were on, you know, A&M had a deal. I think they were on Virgin. In England, mm -hmm. and they yeah. were on, they, yeah, were they had on a couple albums here. out by that, that, by oh, that yeah. point here in the United States. Now, right. but nobody at A and M when I suggested it because I thought it was a, I couldn't get anybody to make the movie. You know, and the, studio, the, the studios also it was a play. I said, well, that's probably why I would make a good movie. <laughs> they mm -hmm. didn't, <laughs> was, um, they didn't know, understand no, that they, logic. They, they <laughs> Answer so was it. I went to A and M and said, well, why don't you make it and I'll put these bands in because there were a lot there were a lot of bands that were on A and M. Also, oh, the music drove the movie. Yeah, and I, and I thought you know naively. Wow, you guys can sell records because I'll, I'll mm -hmm. put the song and you know, it'll all work out fine. Mm -hmm. And they actually they gave me a little bit of money to start making the movie. Mm. And uh, in the meantime, we were going so slow because you know you'd hire somebody for a day, and then you wait a week, and then when they were free again, you know, right. get the casting director for another day. I wrote Sixteen Candles, which I thought, okay, well this is much more commercial because it it had all those you know it had a party, it had a love story, right. <laughs> had a goof, you know, had a car crash, and had all the things. And uh, Universal bought that. And um, I said, I had a problem. I had this deal with, with A&M to sell all their English records. And uh, they, anyway, they, they, bought, they bought Brooks Club from A&M uh, from and made both of them as Universal Pictures. Really yeah. extraordinary that there was, <laughs> a, that was a... No, but I, I can't believe that there was a record label that was more interested in, in you as a director at that point. Well, than was, uh, was Spandau Ballet on A&M at the time? And you used them in 16 no, Candles? I, I, you know, I, I can't I, remember. I don't remember, because I, that I had him on import. Yeah. Because it was that whole new book. <laughs> I used the import in the album, in the, I mean, in the movie. <laughs> that, that's so amazing. You know, I, I mean, there was, there was a time I had a I had a 12-inch remix, and it was, I think it was one of the, it was a 4 AD band. There was nothing on the label except, I think it looked like Paisley wallpaper. And we were trying to figure out what the song was so we could clear it, you know, get the rights, you know, legally. I said, I don't know, I lost the cover. <laughs> but I don't know, it's on here. And, you know, so you have to send somebody out to figure out who did a label with just Paisley on it, you know. Mm -hmm. What did it turn out to be? I think it was, um, God, it was, it was, you know, there was that Art of Noise, um, you know, the, the Trevor Horn stuff. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. then there was a, God, a clan of Zymox, maybe something. Oh, yeah, yeah, something. yeah. Yeah, right. I, I can't, I, I, I can't remember exactly, remember but it was something, something in, something in that uh, ilk. This mm -hmm. is Sound Opinions on 93XRT. We're talking with John Hughes, uh, film director, as we take a look at movie soundtracks. Now, uh, the uh, in, in the film Pretty in Pink, the name of the record star was Trax. Was that a, a nod to Wax Trax? That was uh, that was a little nod to Wax Trax. <laughs> Jim, Jim Nash must have been very happy. About and that. I, I mm -hmm. you know, I gave him a thank you on the end of uh, I think it was I think it was Sixteen Candles because I mean they, that was my yeah you know they they, they were my place. You know? mm -hmm. They were the only store for a long time to buy anything cool in Chicago for for years and years and years. It was like suddenly this little oasis of cool landed on Lincoln Avenue, and for a, probably a span of like maybe five to eight years there, that was a store where you went to buy records. I, I, if you were a serious I, I, collector, I would be in there all you know every Sunday afternoon. I mean, I was there. I could be there for three hours finding stuff. You know, and, the, and it was every week those those import uh, singles came in. And they were in that, right. that big bin. Yeah, no, I, all I think and anybody that plastic that was almost that. impossible to open. Yeah, and they also had they also <laughs> had little stickers. Stuff, yeah. They had little uh, like uh, dividers telling you whether you should actually buy it or not. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah that's, that's very true. There was they, there was there was a definite um, opinion. Yeah. Honestly. Get this is cool. Mm -hmm. Forget it. They put a few stars on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, as we as we swing into this Best Buy universe where everything is superstars. I mean, because I, I had the same sort of situation growing up in Hoboken. There was a, a record store called Pier Platters. You'd go in there, you'd see this guy Bill Ryan, and you'd say, you know, Bill, what do you got for me? Ah, there's this band called the Soft Boys. You need to hear. You know, that's exactly come, what Jim Nash did. Exactly <laughs> yeah. the same yeah. thing. I mean, those guys. Those. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those guys. Right. I had, I had actually Jim Nash a few times. I'd go in there and I'd be buying stuff, and he knew me as a regular kind of guy. He says. 
you don't want this. <laughs> you, you go put it back, you want this instead. Yeah, you know, you go grab something else. And, uh, you know, his taste was impeccable. It was just like, you always got the right stuff. Here's this band called the DBs. You yeah. really need to hear them. <laughs> right. I, feel, I feel very, you know, I feel, I feel bad for a lot of kids that can't get into a, a store like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I mean, to go, to me, buying records was always a sacred experience. And to go into a place where they're selling refrigerators, you've got to walk through the refrigerators <laughs> to go to the records. It's well, that's how you wind up buying the Eminem M record, you know, instead of something good. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, John, uh, you got to tell the story about uh, Pretty in Pink, because just the whole scenario here, Pretty in Pink, you titled a movie, and I thought, my God, somebody's... Somebody's found out about this band, the Psychedelic Furs, and not only that, they're they're titling a movie after it. And what was the whole scenario there? I mean, that that was very fascinating to me. This obscure song, sort of, you know, ending up as a movie movie title in, in, in a very well, well known I, movie. Well, I always liked, you know, I liked the title of that song because it. I, I grew up I grew up in uh, in Detroit, and the toughest guys always wore pink shirts, <laughs> and they wore pink shirts because they wanted you to say something about the pink shirts shirt so they have an excuse to beat you up, you know. And when I saw a song, you know, Pretty in Pink as a, as a title, was sort of daring, you you know? I'm, uh, I mean, it went, it, it, it had it an interesting, because, you know, you see Richard Butler, you see those guys, and they're doing the song called Pretty in Pink. And the song wasn't pretty, and it wasn't pink. And they're, and they're ugly, and they're and scary it, looking. There was, it, and it was just Pretty in Pink. It was just, there was just this nice twist on it. And we, I had this movie that, you know, another one that, that actually had been at Universal, and they passed on it because it was, it was, a, it was a female story. And female stories don't, boys don't go to girls' movies. Are you nuts? Oh my Where God. Where do you think they go to find, you know? Right. We're, we're just assuming that <laughs> of course. These, are, like, these are like only some of the most successful movies of the decade, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I took, it, I took it over to Paramount when, when Ned Tannen moved over. I took it with me, and, and we uh, had come off Breakfast Club. We put Molly in it, and she, you know, she wanted to do it. And I thought, you know, what a great title. That would be, you know, because well, you know they're saying, well, you know, boys don't go to girls' movies. Let's name it Pretty in Pink. Let's make it, you know, if, if that's a problem, let's make it a bigger problem. Let's make it such a big problem it's not a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so we just we 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 got the song. And I said, well, let's, let's use the song, not just the title, but use the song. I had done that before with with Sixteen Candles, mm -hmm. which says something about my <laughs> inability to title, doesn't it? Um, and I just thought it worked great, you know, because it just it went right at it. You know, it wasn't right. we weren't trying to hide the fact that this was this was a story about 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 a, a woman. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a woman story that uh, you know that worked both ways. And let's stick pink in the title and go right. You know, go right. right and, and Pretty it. and Fig is such a dark song too. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Now we we got it queued up, John. Actually, now, now this is the different version. Uh, than the one that was on the album. No, yeah. this is, the no, this is your one. version. We're going to play the, from the soundtrack how, version. How did it come to, did the, did the furs get involved? Did they read oh, yeah. the, They yeah. added horns and stuff for you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which was their choice. Because hmm. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I had a lot of respect for those guys. And the last thing I wanted to do, I mean, I would rather have had a, a movie go, you know, completely fail than have a band that I admired mad at me. Mm -hmm. Or to take them into, take them out of their world where they had, you know, they had their control and they had their respect and bring them into my world, you know, abuse their work, you know, use them and then throw them away and say, you know, I'm sorry, or never, hopefully never see them again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't interfere with that. You know, no. there, was only, there was only one, one time I made a request and that was on an Everything But The Girl song. The demo had a drum machine on it and it was, it was such a great cheap drum song sound that when they read the song they read the drums i think they used the studio guy or something mm -hmm. it was just too slick and i said could you go back to the to the demo but other than that you know the bands did it the way they wanted to do it are most bands really happy to be involved in a film like that to have their song chosen for a film you know it it's it's a and i don't know how it is now because you know i i i, I did reach the the rock with with my son and you know i did that the way i did did it in the 80s you know a lot of respect for the bands do it your way you know, I like what you do. Just give me what you do best. Uh, other than that, I, you know, I don't know. I was, you know, there, there's some money, you know, obviously. They get paid to put the song in, right. you know, and if it's a hit. But a lot of these guys didn't care, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was, a con there was a little controversy about Simple Minds having, having had a hit with a song that wasn't theirs. And you know, people said, you know, did you, you know, did that offend you? And I was like, you know, no, it didn't, because I, I, I understood that. You know, it wasn't their song. They did it. They probably, 
they don't necessarily regret the success, but I'm sure they thought, you know, I wish we'd made it on one of ours. What was wrong with, you know, with one of our, you know, Sparkle and Rain songs, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's a, a, a song being in a film now, uh, you get the video with it, you get a lot of airplay and a lot of attention, yeah. and it certainly does take some bands to a, a level they probably wouldn't get to on their own. Yeah, but, you know, the, the songs that work best in movies are the songs that mean something to the movie rather than just something that's been tacked on. You know, right. I mean, yeah. you, know, you can see it all over the place now. Every, <laughs> every, every television commercial ends with, you know, featuring the music of, and there has, there's this ancient perception, it will not go away, that somebody somebody will go see a movie because Fat Boy Slim's in it. Right. There's yeah. a song, you know. It's, well, <laughs> well, that's it, didn't, it didn't work when I was a kid, it didn't work, that's didn't what work we're gonna, in the 50s. That's yeah. what this show's about, Jim. Yeah, we're gonna be getting, thank you for saying that, actually. We're going to be getting into that in our second segment about songs that I'm not uh, answering. Worked. I'm not answering the questions, I'm getting into the wrong segment. <laughs> no, 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 you're, no, you're getting us fine. to the right segment. You're actually you're leading us fine. right in. And But first, what we're going to do is play Pretty in Pink, the version that was from the film, the remixed version here on Sound But don't forget the original version. No, we never do. In fact, actually, when it when given the choice to play it on the air, I always go for the original version. <laughs>